The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day. The first and only FDA approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Ron Rivers. We continue our discussion on if self-actualization is attainable. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. So in, in your book, you talk about calendars and clocks. Why is that important? Yeah, that's a, a great question. That was like a fun little chat, a little section. Essentially, I argue that our timekeeping methods reinforce specific philosophies of being. So for example, like we're the, the common commerce calendar is the, is the Christian calendar. It's based around you know, the year 2022, right? I believe year zero was purported to be the, the birth of Christ. Um, Christianity as a religion formed approximately like five, 500 years after uh, that fact. So, so you know, I, I think the, the details are a little murky, um, but that in itself reinforces a very specific way of being and a very specific belief structure. And it also, it's also inaccurate, right? I mean, we have plenty of calendars um, throughout the world, um, the, the Jewish calendar, right? The Chinese calendar, that extend far back than that. And I, I think we should go much farther back. I think we should, you know, really celebrate humanity as it is. Our, our present trajectory can really be traced back to the agricultural revolution, right? The advent of agriculture, the changing climate, which forced us to, to, to do that. Um, and, and that could be like a great starting point. So I think, um, I don't remember the exact number. I think the book, it's just like 11,000 something. But the idea is that we should be a little bit more consistent with our calendars, not to preserve any specific spiritual philosophy, but more importantly, to kind of represent the larger human collective progress. I think that in itself, frames the experience of daily life in a very different light than it does, you know, just being, you know, 9, 20, 22. Do you think there's enough empathy and can people be taught how to gain empathy? Uh, it's a great question. Um, is there enough empathy? No. <laughs> can, can people be taught? I think, I think absolutely. Um, the question is, will they choose to, to embrace it, right? I think that people can be taught, but I think one of the big struggles with the immediate present is that because we've lacked an alternative spiritual framework of being, and at the same time, like the present ones are kind of inadequate, like let's be candid, like any, any spiritual philosophy followed today is full of hypo hypocrisy and it has to be, right? Like you can't follow the traditional writing because then we'd have some really draconian you know, laws. Um, so most people who practice these philosophies kind of practice it with their own personal hypocrisy. It's like, well, I choose these things, but I don't choose these things, right? So, um, and so that that itself 
I think one of the big challenges is that we've taken technologies, um, and, I, and I consider all religious things a spiritual technology. Self-actualization in the age of crisis is a technology. It's, but one of the things that they've done, that we've done really over time, is we've elevated our creations above us. So where we are these infinite beings, right? These embodied infinity, our imagination and the universe, the only two observable infinities, where we have this power, we've given a natura- like a naturality and a necessity, like a, a made our systems necessary. We've given them the status that they don't deserve. Our systems, anything we create is, is not beyond us, but in many ways they become our identity. And I think that's the problem. When people start to identify like embody like the power within them with a artifact of our creation that's a misalignment of of who we are the nature of reality it's a misalignment of the capacity of the individual but uh, uh, you know you can turn on any any you know news show i mean there's plenty of evidence of people who are extremely e- ego bound to their positions right and i think that's that's really difficult I do believe it can change through kind of a mass movement, a spiritual revolution, which is kind of what I'm working towards. But I think that it's going to take time. Um, and it'll probably, right, I think the as most revolutions are, it'll probably be led by youth. I think it's a lot easier to kind of redirect your focus and energy when you are open to the world and you're not solidified than it is when you've spent 40 years developing a personality around a specific ideology or belief. Um, then it becomes more about, you know, less about what's the right thing to do and more about, am I willing to like uh, contradict myself? Am I willing to go against the things that I've been preaching, even though I know they're wrong, or will I maintain course to save face, right? And I think it's a very ego-driven decision, and that's a tough thing for a lot of people. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. MacuHealth, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. Empathy is a process, you know, and and it's i really believe it's a learned process and how much of empathy is self-actualization and vice versa yeah i think it's um it's a tremendous part of individual actualization for sure i think you know to your point i think it is learned but i think a lot of it happens in youth right i think empathy is really learned for the young child by observing the parents their interactions with the child their interactions with others um, I don't think empathy is something you teach like an 18 year old when they graduate high school, right? Like that's, that's too far in the game to really root empathy. It doesn't mean they can't change. It just means like when we're talking about like, how does someone learn empathy? I think it really, you know, is around the circumstances that they're kind of born into. Um, in terms of how it relates to individual actualization. So I, I kind of suggest a, a handful of uh, new core values in alignment with the single truth in the relational universe. And several of them kind of coincide with empathy. So for example, relation being one of them. Relation is just the understanding that, you know, you and I inhabit a single happening within the moment, right? We are, although we're fractional in our observation, we're really a single thing happening right now from different perspectives. And I think when you imagine, you know, a higher intelligence, a higher being, um, Alan Watts said this, right? You could imagine if there, if you could imagine God, it would probably be the being that could experience all of our individual perceptions at the same time, right? Because it's a single happening in, in different directions. So understanding our relation to the other. Equity is another one, right? Or the practice of fairness in our personal and systemic relationships with others. I think that's a, a key you know, way to kind of develop empathy. If you believe in fairness, and I mean root fairness, not fairness that kind of elevates your position over others, but a true fairness, then you're much more likely to be empathetic to the individual. Um, I also think that awareness, right? The the practice of awareness in in being aligned with the single truth in the relational universe, like understanding it being momentary, and more importantly, understanding our deep um, you know physical reality. Like it's not again non philosophical. The the nature of of reality as we understand it is this momentary happening we all share. This interconnectivity. When you understand that to be like the physical reality. That that it you know that challenges you to embrace a deeper level of empathy because you and I again 
we're separate in our fractional observation, but we really are the same happening within a moment. And, and that is, you know, here or now, we, we are sharing experience of oneness. And, and that's something that we have to embrace, which I think extends empathy throughout the universe. You know, as we wind up the interview, uh, you you started uh, Spirit, is it Spirit D-A-O or Dao? Dao. Dao. Spirit Dao. And Dao what stands for, a de- oh, sorry. Um, Dao stands for a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, so Dao's are, uh, so um, as a journalist, I have I have many interests, and and uh, one of those has always been emerging technologies. So you may or may not be familiar. There's a term called Web three that's coming out. Web three is essentially tokenized access and identity, um, and it's a really really exciting concept. In my humble opinion, it will be the future of like it'll be like the new internet. It'll be how things operate, and essentially it's it's. Um, identity becomes, we say, trustless. So what I mean by that is if you sign up for anything today, you got to fill out forms, what's your name, what's your email, where do you live, you know, what's all this information about you. In the future, you're going to have a single identity. It's going to be a token. It's representative to you. It's non-transferable. And that token will provide you access and agency through the various systems that you interact with. Now, that empowers a lot of different um, benefits, right? You can choose to stay anonymous. That's a big thing that many people you know, like is, is it's no secret that governments around the world are, are kind of encroaching on privacy, right? Privacy is becoming less and less of a priority of governments. Um, and it's more of this kind of surveillance state. Um, so the web three gives individuals the operation, the ability to kind of build credentials and build reputation, um, without necessarily having to like, be like, my name is Ron Rivers and I live in this state, right? So that's one thing. Spirit DAO is, is our DAO community. Another thing about DAOs um, is that they're, as organizations, they're much more what we would call flat and modular compared to the traditional hierarchy of a corporation. A corporation, if you give it geometry, operates in a triangle. You have the CEO, you have like the layer of senior management, right? Your VPs, and you have everyone else who essentially takes orders. Um, DAOs are much more, you know, a great philosophy for the DAO operation is the leader is the person who knows what to do next, right? Who who knows what to do next? Who has the idea? Who wants to take the ball? And essentially it works um, where there are um, things called bounties. You can suggest proposals. So groups within a DAO, let's say, for example, Spirit DAO, let's say someone wanted to run like a media program. Hey, we wanted to you know, take your 500 page book and distill it into a, a 10 page little you know comic book template. Uh, that would be really beautiful. They would request funds. We pay them from the central wallet. But um, in short, Spirit DAO is the organization tasked with, we have three core purposes, which is spreading the message contained within the book, um, serving our members through both virtual and physical utility. So like spaces, um, uh, like collective spaces, uh, and then supporting other DAOs working towards the eight dignities. Like, so establishing these public works, these global public works. So that's what the organization is. And um, if anyone is interested in, in checking it out or learning more, they can just go to spiritdao.org. Um, that's kind of the organization. It hasn't launched yet. I just launched the book uh, a week ago. So we're kind of like in this, you know, building a plane while flying mode, but here we are. And, uh, but it's been exciting. You know, we've already gotten some, several people interested in kind of helping to kind of build this from the ground up. So as you mentioned Web3, what are the negatives of Web3? Well, negatives would be, I think, really perception-based. So like Web3, if for, for lack of a better term, is a much more socializing of the surplus, if that makes sense. So like everyone in a Web3 organization is a stakeholder. So imagine if every C Corp was a co-op. So, right, like, you know, everyone was getting equal like shares of the revenue. The CEO wasn't getting $300 million while the janitor was getting 10 bucks an hour, right? Like there was some sort of leveling of that compensation. Um, So that's like, you know, if your objective is to become like a Uber billionaire, Web3 is probably not for you. It's much more of a collective kind of space where people are collaborating and working to kind of include people and more importantly, like share the wealth. I think what excites me most about the Web3 atmosphere is that the key players, you know, they're not super concerned about like becoming uber rich. Um, They're not like, I think when you think about like the 2010s, right? Like it was all about like the tech founder. Who's going to like build this unicorn? Who's going to exit? You're going to get a $2 billion valuation and, and make $100 million after 10 years of work, right? Um, that's exciting, certainly, for a lot of people. Don't get me wrong. Like pe- many people can do great things with their wealth. 
Um, but Web3 is more about building collective enterprises in a lot of different directions where like, so for example, you already have Web3 radio companies where all the podcasters get you know, uh, collective revenues that they earn. Um, you have Web3 art companies, you have Web3 uh, develop, Web3 developers, right? Like people who are writing the code is a huge thing um, and a really great trend. So it kind of, it really it builds upon the, the already established open source movement of, you know, free information, open information, collective progress, group think, uh, and kind of, you know, Collab, you know, again, kind of going full circle back to one of the original questions you asked, emphasizing cooperation as the core value over competition. Well, we're going to end it there, but I want to thank Ron Rivers for joining me today. If people want to find out more about you and get your book, how could they do that? Thank you so much, Dr. Gelb. I really do appreciate this. Um, uh, they can find it. So the book is available. You can read the book online, download it for free. Um, by the time this gets posted, the free audio book will probably be up. It's at uh, singletruth.org. So just singletruth, one word, dot org. Um, they could, you could check me out at Twitter at Rivers Mind, R-I-V-E-R-S-M-I-N-D. Um, and yeah, spiritdow.org. Um, you can check us out there. That's our website. You can kind of join our community. We have an open chat discord. Uh, and we'd love to have you, even if you're just more curious or even if you want to get into a healthy debate, I am all about it. Uh, I am here to kind of share these ideas and recognizing that they are not at all perfect and they are really the collective's ideas to, you know, avoid the crisis that's on the horizon. So Dr. Gal, once again, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your time, um, your work and your effort. And thank you for making me, you know, allowing me to be a part of this. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us at Open Your Eyes. This is Dr. Kerry Gell for Open Your Eyes. Until next time. Thank you. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also gonna be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well,
Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.